Hello, everyone. I think we're live now. Oh, we're live. <laughs> uh, one moment, and we're just going to put it onto the Facebook group. We're streaming on Span page now. Uh, so let's just set this up. Um, so while I do this, um, Adam, mm -hmm. do you want to introduce yourself? And other oh, Yes, so. Hello everybody, my name is Adam, um, Adam Batania. Um, I'm a medical doctor and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at SPAN. Um, I've been doing less of SPAN work over the last uh, few weeks over this, uh, over this period, obviously, because I still uh, work, um, I, I, I still work as a doctor at a hospital and uh, my specialty is in internal medicine so we are directly t uh, t treating and um, dealing with COVID-19 patients um, I live in uh, on the outskirts of London so we're, we're, we've been heavily impacted really and uh, over the last few weeks we, we've seen quite a big surge in um, in COVID-19 patients so we're, we're solely focused on that right now um, so let me talk a bit about my own experience because a lot of people have been asking like uh, asking me about that because um, I have I have a bit of a unique experience over the last, last few weeks I've been dealing with this as a doctor and then I, uh, I also dealt with it as a patient um, because I developed symptoms and went into uh, quarantine for a bit um, so at the beginning of this whole thing I was quite skeptical i have to say a little bit skeptical as like most or many other doctors we were kind of like uh, didn't know what to expect um you know we were hearing the stories from china from italy so we were, we were taking all the precautions um and then it started actually hitting us it started hitting us um pretty bad uh but up to this point the numbers are manageable i think the all of the precautions that we did take in the beginning were quite um they were quite well done um and we've seen a, a drop a, a, a big drop in other kind of cases like people coming in for other issues uh, so people are taking the precautions properly and you know uh, coincidentally people who, when people stay at home they get you get less of pneumonias other types of pneumonias you get less of other viral infections and flu goes down um falls accidents all of these things go down so um oh, that's really interesting actually yeah that. one other thing that is interesting is that we actually see an increase in um which is something that's quite sad that we do see an increase in people who are coming in with self-harm and overdose and mm -hmm. uh, suicide attempts these kind of things yeah. um because i think people with already who are already struggling with mental health issues uh, are probably um, this is taking a toll on these kind of people and uh, you know uh, some yeah. people are quite vulnerable yeah. to the to uh, I mean we all are really to it's it's quite emotionally stressful on all of us so if you already have the uh, predisposition of a mental health uh, issue you know um, so we're, we're yeah. seeing a lot of the, these kind of patients coming in um, yeah. and then a few two weeks around two weeks ago I started developing symptoms myself and uh, so I went into self-isolation as per protocol. Um, but, you know, thankfully, my, my symptoms were quite, were quite mild. I, 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 I would probably say for two days, I was a bit, or for three days, I was a bit like uh, ill at home with a fever, with myalgia, which is like pain in your muscles, it's kind of generalized pain. Um, and then gradually I, I got better and uh, for the last, uh, week or so I've been uh, back to work yeah so I'm feeling well so that's my uh, kind of yeah, uh, background yeah. and summary of <laughs> what's going on uh, yeah. how are you doing Rachel how are you doing at home yeah. and yeah. good and actually yeah I just introduced myself to everyone finally we're doing this we're doing a, a live q and it's been on the agenda I think for um a while and it's sad that something so extraordinary um had to happen for us to do it but here we are and we're doing it and then hopefully we can do a lot more uh in the future um and if anyone has any questions please uh you know ask away um i think you ask in the map i mean to be honest it's my first time doing these so not getting my bearings with them but i think yeah you can just comment and then we'll get your questions and then we can 
ask as many of them as we can. Um, but yeah, so I'm a Rachel, nutritionist working with SPAN, and we have our, um, you know, the reverse uh, PCOS, pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes group. Um, it's great to finally kind of be chatting to you guys and getting to know all of you better as well. Uh, it's been kind of a journey where, um, you know, just messaging, getting to know you all has been wonderful. Um, so, yeah, really looking forward to this. In terms of, um, you know, yeah, coronavirus, absolutely. It's been uh, a lot of adjustments. Um, and, you know, interesting, like that you say about getting symptoms and that kind of thing. You know, I got some kind of familiar symptoms to mm. coronavirus, but, you know, I don't know if I had it or I didn't have it. Yeah. Um, but they were very slight, but they were, uh, yeah, definitely kind of in line with what uh, the symptoms were. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to tell because, like, you know, obviously yeah. um, you, you, people get these symptoms all the time. And just now, because it's in the spotlight, people, uh, exactly. you know, you start examining yourself more. Uh, however, like most people who do get the virus uh, do actually get very mild symptoms or are asymptomatic. So yeah, uh, exactly. the precautions that we're taking are mostly not for because it's you know so severe with everyone it's just to to kind of uh, minimize the risk for people for groups that are the most vulnerable exactly yeah absolutely um yeah and it's kind of i guess a situation too where you become a lot more aware of your body and how it's feeling on a day-to-day -day basis so you kind of notice these things more which isn't a bad thing it's actually a great thing i think for people to really uh tap into what's going on in their life and pay attention to that and you know just have rest and mind yourself sorry can you hear that noise yes, I a <laughs> <laughs> oh i like your your chair cover there sorry say that again <laughs> oh with sheepskin oh yeah <laughs> got to keep cozy <laughs> so yeah to kind of i guess get the ball rolling we had a few questions uh from the group which is brilliant um so i'm just going to get those up now uh oh we got a new one as well brilliant um so the first one um was from humra am i pronouncing that right um please let me know if i'm not because i've been chatting to you uh before um, so her question was, her fasting blood sugar levels remain 107 to 108 um, microgram per deciliter. A1C was 5.4 three months back. Really good result. Um, I'm on a moderate carb diet. I walk for 30 minutes, four days a week. Do I need any medication? I have no symptoms relating to diabetes too. So I think that's a question for Fantastic. Well, um, I would definitely say no to the to medication. I mean, your, your HbA1c uh, is, is pretty good, right? Uh, so I've, whatever you're doing is working out for you, and um, I would uh, keep doing what, what you're doing. That sounds great. Yeah, yeah it sounds like you're yeah. definitely on the right track there really? and uh, doing really well. So, yeah, keep going. Um, and those fasting levels as well will, you know, just through diet and lifestyle changes, they'll come down as well. So, um, yeah. Yeah, the fasting levels are maybe a bit high, but I mean, your HbA1c is pretty good. So it, it might be just that you're kind of, you're peaking fast and you're going down. Um, so yeah, exactly. you, might, you might want to think about um, maybe a lower glycemic index foods um, and uh, uh, kind of continuing um, the lo a low carb diet. So yeah. lower, so the glycemic index measures the speed of which. So when you eat something, it measures the speed of which it increase it, it, it peaks your or spikes your blood sugar. <laughs> and uh, so a lower glycemic index food would uh, spike your blood sugar very slowly, and uh, um, a higher glycemic index food, such as like juice, um, you know. Uh, yeah. Anything with with sugar in it, yeah, like kind of you know, like, juice, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that will spike your blood sugar very quickly. So your yeah. insulin will have to go up really quickly and kind of lower it down. Um, so maybe that very vari variation um, is 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 something that you want to think about. Yeah. And in order to reduce that, you want to kind of rely more on low glycemic, lower glycemic index carbs. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so we have another question here from Debbie. Um, uh, so she first said, if you weren't able to make the Q&A tomorrow, will there be some type of posting on Q&As? We'll definitely try and save this on the group. And yeah. so then I'll be, you know, there uh, saved and accessible uh, forevermore. So that might be actually on the SPAN health group. So if you can't find it, I'm not too sure. We'll see how it kind of um, happens. But if not, we can do a write up and, you know, have all these questions and answers. Um, so I understand carbs are converted to glucose and affect my fasting glucose and A1C levels. Question is, do proteins affect glucose? For example, is it possible to eat low carb and eat too much protein so that your fasting glucose and A1C levels increase? That's um, a really good question, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of people feel that uh, you know, if you you can eat a high protein diet and not worry about your glucose, but that, that's actually not true. So your yeah. protein does get converted inside the body to glucose, so it can actually spike your glucose. Uh, and people who have continuous uh, glucose monitors find this quite interesting when you take like a, a, mm. a protein shake, or um, you can see a, a big spike in your yeah. blood glucose. Yeah. Uh, so that's something that you have to think about. Um, yeah. The proper ketogenic diet would be would be like moderate to low protein. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also, you would want to space it out, space out your protein intake. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So definitely, if you're eating too much protein, that will probably spike your yeah. glucose. Um, so the, the right amount of protein, like as a rule of thumb, you would say 1.5, 1 to 1.5 grams. Um, yeah. yeah. Per, Gram. Yeah, and that's what we have in the SPAN app as well for calculating yes, exactly. macronutrients, um, you know, which is kind of a good level for most people. But I guess the best way to know for, you know, everyone as we are all individuals, just test your glucose and keep testing and finding out that level that's right for you. Because as well, if you start doing more activity, um, you might actually need to then increase your protein and you'd be able to eat more of it. So it's kind of, for, you know, it can change. Yeah, that's a great point, Rachel, because uh, if you have a higher muscle mass or your activity is higher, you might want yeah. more protein. You're utilizing it more. So you exactly. want to, exactly, it's it's about finding the number that works for you. Uh, yeah. Especially yeah. In, the, in the beginning when you're starting to change your diet, you want to yeah. measure your blood glucose quite regularly and after meals, after different kind of, kinds of meals. And to kind of get a get a feel of what, what, you know what's right for you really yeah exactly yeah um brilliant and there's an actually an extra question here uh mm. from debbie so my labs ferritin um stored iron range is 19 to 224 uh does low say 19 to uh so 224 so say does low say 19 to 22 or normal less than 19, ferritin affect fasting blood glucose and A1C? Um, well, there is it's kind of a bit of correlation there, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't think about it. Um, it like it, it, generally, it wouldn't affect your HbA1c. Um, I mean, your a low hemoglobin could lead to a low, kind of a lower reading of HbA1c, or like a falsely low reading. Yeah, um, but I wouldn't act on that, I, but definitely if your ferritin is low, you would maybe think about uh, iron supplements. To yeah, yeah. Increase your ferritin level, yeah. Um, something actually my, people might find interesting. So I, I'm anemic and my um, A1C is uh, generally, you know, just that bit higher, but I know it's uh, maybe not the most accurate representation of yeah, my blood. Element. Yeah, exactly. Because I test my glucose at home and I know my average and I know it's much lower than that. Um, but as well with supplementing with iron, so some t some people can actually have in their uh, microbiome these bacteria um, that are iron loving bacteria and they're pathogenic. So supplements sometimes when you take them the bacteria go a bit mad, gobble them all up, they don't reach your system and they get stronger and more like um, pathogenic basically. Um, so there's that's just something to keep in mind if an iron supplement isn't working for you and it's not uh, resolving your anemia, you might need to um, look at your gut or you know look at other 
um, vitamins as well, like your B12 could also be really important there too. Um, so yeah, if anemia is something that's an issue for you, but it, like with the A1C, your fasting glucose, it shouldn't have an impact, should it? A, a low um, iron or anemia. Not on your fasting glucose, no. Yeah. So I think, yeah, that would be a good, if you are anemic, maybe would that be a good um, test to use, your fasting? Yes, your, your HbA1c sh still would be a good test to, because it would yeah. give you, because it's mostly about the um, the behavior of the, uh, or like the trend. So yeah. if you're going up or if you're going down in relation to your to lifestyle changes or medication. Yeah. So that's the, actually a better indicator than like the one snapshot number. Well, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And it's uh, it's also just a lot more interesting to kind of, and it, be, it can become quite um, uh, addictive in a way, testing your glucose, because you want to see, you know, yeah. you know, what affects it or what doesn't affect it. And it's really quite interesting to... Um, Very interesting. And it's amazing yeah. how variable it is to, from person to person. This is yeah. what we're like discovering now with continuous glucose monitors that are becoming quite yeah. prevalent. Because yeah. um, the kind of the classical way of doing it has been on like uh, um, on uh, on like snapshots of our blood glucose after like a few hours after food or, or fasting glucose. Um, now we have the data that can show us the variability from person to person, and even things uh, eating things such as um, uh, so for certain foods for some certain people can spike blood glucose much more than other people, exactly. which is really interesting. And yeah. some people are linking it to kind of inflammation and uh, allergies. So people who have uh, like an allergy to certain foods, but it's not the, an overt allergy which produces symptoms. It's just like a, a very slight yeah. kind of allergy because yeah. it is a spectrum. Um, it can, that can induce inflammation in your body, which spikes your glucose. Uh, for someone else, that same food might be uh, exactly. Perfect. Yeah. Totally fine. Coffee is a big one for me where, oh. you know, I know if I have a cup of coffee, I can definitely feel it and it does um, spike my glucose. Um, mm. But then there's other people and they can drink like five cups of coffee a day and they're totally, you know, their blood glucose is fine. And yeah. also the caffeine doesn't seem to affect them either. Um, yeah. And, there is an know, effect of uh, like uh, people who are used, to, uh, your body kind of gets used to it. Uh, yeah. So you have desensitization to the effect of it. Yeah. Yeah. So. I wish, like, I love coffee so much. <laughs> um, I'm not a coffee drinker, so I, I can't come. Oh, <laughs> that's such a good thing. I wish, like, I never touched the stuff. <laughs> um, so. So from Chris uh, Baker is, how do I get my A1C down? Um, so yeah, do, do you want to go with that one? I, I mean, uh, I, 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 obviously, um, this is like our goal in general is to lower yeah. our, our HbA1c and keep it at a healthy level. Uh, so the approach we take at SPAN is we want to um, change our nutrition and understand really our, our, how nutrition affects us and help um, help you uh, achieve that goal without having to go to the last resort of medications so yeah. maybe you want to take this one and maybe talk about that for a little bit yeah absolutely so i mean our approaches um for getting a1c down kind of i guess we work on the principles of how does diabetes develop and then kind of working backwards or well, how can we reverse this and how can we kind of undo i guess you know how it's developed um, so kind of the two, I guess, principles is it's too much insulin and too much glucose. And they're in a way symptoms of insulin resistance. So what can we do that can bring our insulin and our glucose down in everyday life? Um, so that for us would be, you know, low carb diet, reducing that insulin spike, reducing um, that kind of load on the body gives the body a chance to use glucose from the cells. Um, intermittent fasting, again, you know, just giving that body a chance to use glucose, you know, reduce the load in the body. Exercising, again, is another one when you're kind of ready for that um, and providing it doesn't cause too much stress 
um, in doing exercise as well. And stress and good sleep. I mean, those two are just really important um, and can raise our blood glucose so much. So it's just doing, you know, lifestyle changes that really, um, you know, nurture our well-being and our stress levels. So we're yeah, I think the, 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 like the three or four things that you can do that can kind of give you 80, 90 percent of uh, um, of control over your your health uh, are, as you said, exercise, sleep, dietary changes, like yeah. eating well and uh, stress management. So if you get these things right, you can, you're kind of 90 percent. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Um, so most people will be able to do if you're able to do these things. You won't need, really need to go on to more interventional kind of uh, um, uh, treatments. Yeah. So yeah. Um, maybe actually one of one of the things that I feel that helped uh, me understand my, my own body and help many people, especially people with diabetes, um, yeah. is kind of to understand what's going on and understand the kind of underlying physiology in a. Yeah. You know, simple but like uh, understandable way. So maybe I'll I'll go through that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, go through what um, I think is a, a, a it's not uh, like the most accurate scientific way of understanding it, but it is kind of a useful model to yeah. understand what happens when we eat. So the total amount of um, of uh, of glucose in our body, in our blood, in our bloodstream is is around twenty five millimoles. Um, so that would be equivalent to a teaspoon of sugar. It's tiny. That's, it's tiny, right? <laughs> um, and that's in your, all of your bloodstream. So uh, obviously blood sugar or blood glucose goes uh, into your uh, cells. Um, so what, what happens is, is, so you want to keep that in mind when you eat, uh, especially when you eat something sugary, that if you're putting in uh, like uh, another teaspoon of sugar into your bloodstream, you're actually doubling the amount of uh, glucose in your in your blood. Yeah. Um, so the you're doubling, uh, you're going up to the double the normal amount. So what your body does to respond to that is it it, it, um, it secretes the hormone called insulin, which yeah. uh, kind of takes out the um, helps the glucose go into the cells of the body and be utilized as energy. But um, so what happens is your blood sugar goes up, it spikes up, and then your insulin level goes up as well to help it go, in, go into the body. Um, then you're, so your blood sugar starts going down in response to the insulin spike. Um, what happens is um, the insulin level stays high for a little bit longer as the blood sugar goes down. So you have a period of hyperinsulinemia, which is a high level of insulin, with a low blood sugar. And one of the other effects of insulin is that it stops your body from utilizing already existing energy stores mm -hmm. in your fat, in your liver. Yeah. Because it, you're, it's telling your body that we have an abundance of energy. We have loads of glucose in our body. So we don't need to, you know, to keep the stores uh, closed. We don't yeah. want to use the stored energy. We want to store uh, all of the energy we, uh, we're getting in. But. Uh, so you're, yeah, exactly. So what happens is when your blood sugar goes down, then your brain starts looking for energy. It can yeah. only get it from the blood. It can't access the stored energy because of the high insulin. So you want to. So it starts hunting for ex external sources of food, which is why people who uh, rely on uh, simple carbohydrates on, uh, on their uh, their diet um, get hungry uh, like an hour or two after eating. Uh, yeah, that's why when you have a pastry, you, you you feel okay for half an hour to an hour, or until it, like uh, uh, you know an hour and a half later, you're hungry again. It's not really filling um, because you're you can't access the stored energy. Um, that's why people who uh, rely on so simple carbohydrates uh, find it hard to lose weight because you know yeah. they're not eating as much, but they're still not losing weight because your energy levels or your energy stores, your fat are locked in because of the high insulin all the time. So yeah. the whole approach is to lower your insulin level and, yeah. and treat the hyperinsulinemia. And the way we we recommend doing that is by lowering your simple carbohydrate intake and relying yeah. more on healthy fats uh, to take yeah. your energy instead of simple uh, carbohydrates. And that lowers your insulin and it allows your body to utilize the already existing energy stores in your fat and in your liver um, and it allows you to kind of not rely solely on 
uh, eating uh, like uh, on eating all these kind of um, high carbohydrate uh, foods for your energy. Yeah, exactly. That's so uh, nicely explained. Um, yeah, I think absolutely. It's kind of and as well, people feel um, you know when when you are kind of stuck on that perpetual uh, glucose burning, um, you are you know constantly hungry and craving things. Um, and you know, for a lot of people, they feel like, oh, well, that's just me. I'm just always hungry it's always been me but actually it's your hormones are really coming into play here and you know just kind of like feed me feed me feed me but then once you get those you know hormones balanced um and your meta your metabolism uh changes your metabolic flexibility improves so that's um a change where you can easily tap into those fat stores and your body doesn't go into this panic of like I need more energy. It can just go like, oh yeah, here's our energy stores from fat. Let's use them. Um, and that's when you can, you know, you're you're fine to go hours and hours without food. Um, and I think kind of just something to add with, you know, carbohydrates and you know, keeping our blood glucose in that that range. A lot of people um are worried that if they don't eat carbohydrates, then their blood glucose is just gonna you know fall too low but our bodies are just beautifully designed that we you know when our blood glucose are going low it's like oh well let's use our our stores here so we can make glucose whenever you know we need to and we don't need to get them from diet which i think um we've kind of been maybe made believe a lot with like uh, well, it's, yeah. it's easy because we've kind of like evolved to if we find a, a dense energy source uh, that yeah. um, it's rich in carbohydrates, which is quite rare in nature, really. Yeah, um, we, we, that's yeah. why we, that's why we like it. That's why it's, it tastes sweet to us. Exactly. Um, because if, yeah. if you find, a, you know, a honey in a beehive, you, oh, yeah. you utilize that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> right but um we've kind of hacked our evolution and now yeah. these kind of uh, sugars are abundant and but our you know our primitive brains don't understand that and you know if it's always abundant if you have donuts uh, available 24 7 you yeah. kind of it's really hard not to do that not to yeah. you know eat them all the time exactly. um, yeah so and it takes a lot of uh, kind of uh, um, understanding and willpower and that kind of thing but also with the help of uh, people like yourself rachel and with the help of uh, uh, you know p p with the right tools you can find ways of uh, not relying on only on your like self motivation and your um yeah. your willpower you can actually find suitable substitutes for foods exactly. that you like so you don't have to go hungry and you don't have to eat food that you don't like you can have a nice uh, you know a nice filling diet that is uh, rich and things that you like to eat um exactly yeah, without giving up the foods that you like and still be healthy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One not, of the yeah. things that you talked about once, and maybe you want to talk about that, is um, a lot of people don't actually are not craving uh, the actual food. You're maybe craving the sensation or the uh, texture of the food. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that was a big thing for me, I think, with, uh, you know, changing my diet. Um, so I kind of made a very quick transition, you know, straight, very strict uh low carb and texture was the biggest thing for me or like it was something vinegary or salty but i just kind of really finding what exactly it was i'm craving because it, it might be that you're craving um you know a packet of crisps but it might actually really be the crunch or you know the saltiness or something like that so it's just finding those substitutes and i think that's what you know we really kind of try and do with span and in the group is just um helping people find the food that they love and you know focusing on eating them more and enjoying them more and fulfilling their life with them and then eventually those older foods just kind of you know gently get um you know move to the background and they're not as important anymore um and you start enjoying all these other things um, so what would you say because uh, i've actually been getting a lot of this uh, question um yeah. 
uh, how how can people kind of keep um, up with their kind of dietary changes uh, if they're in quarantine with the situation that's going on now? And especially um, they're kind of, you know, people are being knocked out of their daily habits. And that's when you kind of revert to old habits. And that's where you, you revert to your comfort foods and that kind of thing. So uh, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, well, I think this is kind of habit changing and you're always going to have these moments where, you know, motivation is going to waver. Um, things aren't going to be, you know, set in place and they're not going to, it's not going to be the ideal environment. And, you know, that's always going to happen. So I think it's just, um, this is when, you know, habit changes really come into play and just reminding yourself of, you, you know, your reasons of why you want to change what's the version of you that you want to build and like looking towards that and getting excited about it as well you know and not kind of thinking about the past or thinking about bad habits or anything like that just you know that's all negative thinking so just throw that away but thinking focusing on you know you and what's important to you and your ambitions in life and looking forward I think that's really important um, and just having that positivity as well because of course, right now it's really challenging and, you know, things can be feel quite negative. So it's just building that um, positivity, I think, is really important. And um, as you always say, if if you do kind of, um, you know, like, go wild and <laughs> binge on something uh, once in a while, uh, you know, don't dwell on it. It's fine. You've, uh, you know, you've enjoyed it. It's, it's you know, sometimes we, we all do it. We, we enjoy yeah. a nice uh, meal that is like a, yeah. a nice cheat meal here and there. And then you kind of uh, just go back to your um, exactly your normal. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't yeah. have to like, um, you know, knock you off. For, no, for a long no, period of time, no, just enjoy no. it and, and move on. I, move I think uh, talking about habits, uh, that's um, one interesting point uh, is to kind of, even though our, our, our daily routines have changed and people, you know, uh, you're not going to work every morning, you're not doing your, your usual yeah. stuff, it's important to kind of think of this as, um, or to try and keep your habits as similar as possible to exactly. normal so try to still like wake up at the same time yeah. go to bed at, at, at a reasonable time you know you know, it's not like an extended holiday it's more like you know you try and keep your daily routines yeah. you know get up in the morning uh, and you know the, uh, do the things that you usually do but just kind of find substitutes for them that you can do in quarantine exactly um, yeah and even just i mean it's a great chance to do things more of the things that you've been wanting to do for a really long time and you've kind of put it off because you know you've had work you've had commutes and that kind of thing but now you perhaps have that this extra time to uh, start doing these things that you wanted to do for a long time yeah, yeah. and that might be as well like a hobby or something that you you know did years ago and you've totally forgotten about it and that's also a great way to kind of just stay on track is just doing more of these enjoyable things and and just feeling happier in your kind of situation and also a distraction from um, eating and kind of comfort eating and that kind of thing so just finding different outlets other than food uh, for enjoyment because I think you know for the majority of us comfort you know food is uh, comfort and um, I mean rightly so it's absolutely delicious uh, but it's just finding these other things that actually bring us a lot of joy as well absolutely and it's also um so i think that uh, something that works for me or like that i find works mostly for me is um so to, to use the tools that we talk about uh, on our, our program and you talk about uh, to, to kind of uh, you don't have to use use the same tools all, all the time so if your lifestyle changes uh, yeah. you can kind of find other tools that work for you so uh, like broadly speaking there's like kind of three tools that you can use for um, in relation to diet so we have the quantity of food that you eat and you have the uh, quality of food that you eat so low carb that kind of thing and then you have the um the time restricted feeding so yeah. you can restrict the amount of food you eat into like eight hour windows or 10 hour windows for example um so for for me during this time um i feel like uh, for me i i like to eat like it's it's honestly it's hard for me to restrict the quantity of food i eat i like to have big yeah. meals so i try to limit that to maybe one meal a day if i'm off or two meals a day if i'm working and uh, limit that to like a six hour or eight hour window and then fast for the rest of the day 
Yeah. Um, yeah. And I yeah. Think, so that these kind of practices can really help you stay on track with uh, when, yeah. uh, in regard to your diet. Yeah, and I think that's so important. You know what you've um, uh, what you just mentioned there is just finding kind of you know what um, your eating habits and how you um, how you like to eat. Are you a breakfast person? Are you a dinner person? Yes. And if that's really important to you, well then keep doing that. Um, and you know, find kind of other areas that feel more manageable. And like, yeah, that that feels like very organic to me. Of you know, skipping breakfast, I'll do that. Um, and then kind of finding those things to fit in. But yeah, I think like for me, um, you know, right now is actually a really nice time to just because we're not getting outside so much and activity and that kind of thing. Uh, fasting is a re- this time is a really nice time to just practice those fasting regimes uh because they're quite they can be quite like um calming and spiritual in a sense and uh you know you do sometimes need to just kind of rest and totally embody the whole experience of it so it's kind of a for me it's been a nice time to practice it um so yeah it's kind of i guess we're we're finding kind of the best out of the situation (laughs) are we using it to her (laughs) <laughs> um, I just wanted to address this comment that we got from uh, Ian. Thanks, thanks, Ian, for for commenting. He said that Span Health appears to be a commercial enterprise touting for business. And yeah, I mean, Span Health, we are a, um, a for profit organization. However, we we do we have uh, our platform is free, and we can we have um, a free, a free consultations that you can have for that anyone can access. Uh, we also have a very active Facebook group that is. Um, kind of peer to peer, so a lot of people are helping themselves um, through a kind of peer support. So uh, m- most of what you do really isn't about um, you know kind of trying to convert these people to paying customers. Most of it is building really a um, building a, a community around this, and most of what we do is is free. So there is a lot of uh, um, benefit that you, you can do out of it. You can get out of it um, without being a paying customer. Yeah, absolutely. I think just, you know, our references to SPAN, it's just saying that this is our approach in it. Uh, and people who are on the group will know what this is. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, our reference to SPAN, really. We're not trying to, uh, yeah, like. And our, our main target is also um, healthcare providers because we want to kind of access um, people who will benefit from this approach the most who have chronic diseases. And we want to access them through. Uh, healthcare providers and through um, uh, through insurance companies and uh, employers. So yeah. uh, we want to be, you know, we really um, ask people to, you know, <laughs> no one gets asked to to pay for the free services that we provide. Yeah, anyway. exactly. Yeah, mm-hmm. I saw actually Patrick uh, like me. Um, I'm <laughs> assuming that comment was about coffee. Yes, <laughs> Patrick is a big coffee con- connoisseur. <laughs> and he can drink gallons of the day and still maintain just complete clarity and <laughs> no jitters at all. Um, we have a, um, a question from Ross Ray. How do you guys maintain a diet when socializing with friends, going to restaurants and bars, etc.? Um Oh, there's quite a few. Uh, do you want to go for this one? Well, uh, the, the tricks and tips that I give for this one is, yeah. um, so first of all, drinking. Uh, so, I mean, there are uh, there are types of alcohol that uh, are low carb and are probably best to go for. So uh, whiskey, straight, that kind of thing, hard drinks, um, str- but you can have them without mixers. Um, you know, they can give you still give you the buzz without yeah. the... The, the carbs uh, so things to stay away of would be wine obviously um, like white wine mostly and um, and beer also is quite quite high in carbohydrates so if yeah. you want to stick to kind of low carbohydrate versions stay away from mixers obviously um, uh, one thing is hard that is quite hard to do sometimes when you're when you are out and socializing you get peer, peer pressured into um, you know eating what's available especially at parties stuff like that you have um, well, it depends how often you are in these situations. Obviously, if it's a part of a regular part of your life, 
you want to find suitable alternatives just because you are out doesn't mean you want to kind of um, just go go gung ho and you know uh, get off your you know your regular diet, but you don't want to be a bummer. Also, you don't want to be the the person who d doesn't participate. So yeah. I stick to to meats. So you know, order a nice juicy steak. That's kind of you know that's quite healthy and yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's got uh, envious low carb. Eyes. Yeah, Dark exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, absolutely, I think, and it's so important not to feel. Um, embarrassed about having dietary requirements, I think. Especially, I wouldn't say they're even dietary requir requirements. You're yeah. just kind of uh, sticking to more healthier options, uh, yeah. and most places now have, do have healthier options. So that's quite. Uh, it's, uh, exactly, it's a yeah. thing. Yeah, but it, it can be difficult, um, especially I, I would say like at work kind of uh, events um, when people bring their own foods, that kind of thing. You kind of uh, you know, and there's or like you know, kind of house parties, that kind of thing, house dinner parties. It's, it's sometimes you have limited options, um, so you can kind of pick and choose what what you, what you get from the uh, from the table. But also, if you can limit the quantity, that's also a big thing. Yeah, so exactly. you know you can eat whatever you want. If you limit the quantity, you still have yeah. you're still not going um, you know going crazy with uh, yeah absolutely. Uh, with your diet yeah. And like bringing you know if it is that you're going to a friend's house or something like that. Um, you know like let them know and say that you'll bring along something uh to the dinner party and you know bring enough for everyone to share um as well because no doubt everyone will want a taste of what you're eating um and just kind of being prepared i guess for those you know uh business um meetings or anything that you have food just have something with you prepared that if there isn't anything there then you have a backup plan um, and if you're really worried, then just have a big meal before you go out. <laughs> then you can really <laughs> and one out. trick that you can also do at, like, especially um, functions, like uh, functions and events, when they have you know biscuits and all of that on, and sandwiches, um, yeah. just stick to like a, a cup of coffee or something like that. It can be, yeah. can be quite filling, um, exactly. and you don't have to eat anything. Just stick to a, a big cup of coffee, and that'll keep you uh, yeah, going yeah, for the day. Really good one, yeah. And it just kind of fills that having something in your hand, you know. Yeah, to yeah like you're sipping something, you're doing something, you're not, um, yeah, you're not yeah, completely you're not abstaining. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, no, that was a good question. And I think, yeah, we could uh, talk a long time <laughs> of that as well, of different yeah. tricks and tips. Um, I'm going to head back here to the uh, Facebook group. Um, so we have one more a uh, comment here from Melissa Snyder. Meal plannings, things you can and can't have. Um, so I guess, yeah, we have um, a list of, you know, foods that we would recommend that you include in your diet. The, uh, I guess the kind of obvious ones that we would say, try and remove these as much as possible is processed foods, um, your typical kind of carbohydrates, so your potatoes, pasta, rice, um, you know, those kind of real like carby thing, rich foods, um, fruits maybe as well, reducing those. Um, but just kind of starting to remove these to a level that feels good for you as well um, and not kind of delving into it too much. But in terms of meal planning, I have to say my meals are very boring and they always start with an avocado um, and then something on top of that. It could be like eggs, it could be meat, it could be, you know, salad. Um, but in terms of meal planning, I think keep it really simple. Focus on the things you enjoy from that list of foods to include. Um, and yeah, make changes at your kind of own pace. Well, do you have anything else to add to that? Adam? No, that's great. I mean, I don't believe that your meals are boring because I've seen your food. And it's definitely not boring. <laughs> <laughs> ones I know I'm gonna show. <laughs> um, no, they're very, yeah, they're very quick. Something interesting actually I have found is, so for those actually, so I, um, I did cooking uh, before I studied nutrition um, and so I've always been interested in food and that kind of thing um, and my partner, that's how I met him, he really loves cooking as well. But I've noticed that since I've um, adopted this way of eating, my meals take 
like no length at all to make. Whereas my partner, if he was wanting his meal, which was, you know, more carbohydrate based, it would take so much longer. Um, so that's kind of, I think it's just something um, unexpected that Kate has come from it. I kind of thought like, oh, it's, you know, going to be more restrictive. I'm going to have to spend more time uh, cooking, but actually it's made things so much easier um, as well in terms of like shopping. You just know that you're going to go to the fruit and veg, um, the meat section, the fish section, the cheese section, and that's kind of like it. So shopping is like no length as well. Um, I totally agree with that. I found the same thing with with myself. I I you know I, I always cook in and I cook all my meals and it doesn't take much of my time at all. I, yeah. I come home really hungry from work, I go to the gym and then come back you know uh, very hungry. It takes me twenty minutes to whip up a really good healthy meal. So yeah, it definitely yeah, does. Exactly. Uh, it does have that effect. Um, yeah. Talking about shopping, uh, what kind of shops do you shop at? Uh, I've I've had a lot of uh, questions from the recipes that you put on uh, put, you put up. Yeah. Um, the some of the ingredients are yeah. quite difficult for some people to get. Uh, so where where do you get these ingredients, and where do you uh, recommend? So I'll get a lot of them. Um, so our local shop here is uh, there's a, a Waitrose, so I get most of the things there, um, and they're quite good with having. Um, those kind of, I guess, different ingredients, maybe like the xanthan gum or things like that. They now stock. I think Tesco as well might stock that as well. So, um, so um, like you know, kind of generally for like people who um, you know live elsewhere or whatever, uh, what yeah. kinds of shops would you go to? Just the normal like kind of big chains, or would you go for online shopping, that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. And um, so, yeah, the the normal shops, um, but also. I think health food shops as well will stock health a lot of those kind of different ingredients um, online. I mean, Amazon is fantastic that you can get mm. most things and then get it delivered the next day. Um, so yeah, for those kind of more hard to find things, and also you're going to have things like maybe, for instance, like vanilla extract that doesn't have sugar in it, which is hard to find. So something like that is definitely um, something to get online. Um, we're in the process of uh, creating a directory of different brands, um, you know, that we like and where to get things as well. Um, so that's hopefully going to be something that's a bit more useful uh, to people so that they know exactly what kind of ingredient it is, because there's so many different variations. I mean, sweet natural sweeteners is a good example of that, where yes, absolutely. Um, say, you know, stevia, erythritol, monk fruit, but actually you can get stevia that has fillers like maltodextrin in it, which is not going to be great at all. So um, having these kind of certain ones that we do recommend um, would be something that might help people. Um, but yeah, just looking out for, you know, reading all the labels and just being a detective in it and just finding those restricted ingredients, I think is really important as well and just being mindful of it. Um, because there are so Absolutely. many uh, products out there that kind of make themselves appear healthy or keto as well. Yeah. Is it kind of that buzzword, which, um, you know, people assume is like, oh, it's not going to cause a glycemic um, response, yeah. but actually sometimes they do. Um, so it's a bit sneaky. Yeah, especially um, uh, like protein bars, uh, shakes, these kind of yeah. things that can kind of um, give you the illusion that it's a low carb, um, like same car same amount of carbs as a glass of milk or something like that. They have these kind of buzzwords. I, um, yeah. Y you have a few brands that are quite deceptive in that way. Um, I mean, if you do have the time and uh, energy to measure yourself after you ha have these kind of foods, that'll be better. But a lot of these foods, you you can just look at the um, at the nutrition values at the uh, at the back and um, and kind of get a good understanding. And also also look at also always look at the um, the how many grams the product is, and look at the how many servings, and then look at the amount of carbohydrates per serving and make sure that you're you know the total amount of uh, carbohydrates because a lot of the time they say it has like you know uh, 30 grams of of uh, carbohydrates per 100 100 uh, grams 
but the bar or whatever has like 250 grams in total. Yeah, so. Exactly. I mean, it's so sneaky. Yeah. And we just have to be so vigilant about reading um, them. Absolutely. I think that's a really good um, point as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry. I'm just going to double check here and see. Uh, so, yeah, we don't have any more uh, questions. Okay. Um, but I think, you know, we're hopefully going to keep on doing this. Um, you know, let's see how, you know, if people, you, your feedback on the group would be great. Uh, let us know, you know, how you found it, what you'd like to hear more of, um, what you don't want to hear about. Um, let us know and we can hopefully do more of these, um, you know, once a week or that kind of thing. But you're Absolutely. Uh, everything we do, we, we always appreciate uh, feedback to, to kind of improve. Yeah. And um, yeah, so if anyone has any suggestions, anything that they liked, anything that they didn't like, uh, or something they would like to hear about, if they want to do more questions, that kind of thing, uh, just let us know and uh, we're, we'll be happy to do something like this more regularly. Yeah, absolutely. And then I guess... Um, on kind of finishing, do you have any kind of words of just uh, encouragement for people or reassurance, I guess, yeah. um, for right now? Because you were. Well, I mean, you know, we're all stressed in this situation, uh, but, uh, and we hear a lot about, uh, you know, vulnerable groups and uh, like kind of scaremongering in that way. And it's, it's good to be aware of your own situation and your own kind of vulnerabilities if you are. Um, someone who is of a certain age or of, has certain comorbidities but the whole point of what we're doing is that if you do have metabolic problems if you do have diabetes um, you, you can with the right lifestyle changes you can mitigate these risks and you can yeah. um, you know you don't have to be a, a part of the vulnerable group but you, you maybe do need to be a bit more um, vigilant and a bit more aware of, of what's going on and uh, you know uh, um, and kind of just be a bit more um responsible but you know it's yeah. not something to be afraid of we're not afraid of this but we want to be responsible and it's just the same as like um uh, you know on a societal level how everyone's being responsible with social distancing and all of that uh, on the uh, for yourself you want to be responsible um but still maintain like uh, uh, you know try and reduce your stress and not be afraid yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, every kind of effort, uh, every day, any kind of step towards, um, you know, lowering your blood glucose or, um, you know, that's something to like feel proud of. And it's a really brilliant step in the right direction. So like all our efforts every single day um, are really valuable. So and yeah, and and don't fail with abandon. Fail, failing with abandon is like when you um, kind of miss, uh, do like a, uh, make a mistake, and then kind yeah. of throw in, throw the towel, throw in the towel, and like just uh, give up uh, because of one mistake. Um, you know, if you do that, it's fine. You enjoyed it, and then kind of move on and go back to to what you were doing before. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I think that's the, one of the biggest things that, that make people fail. Um, one misstep and then that's it, they give up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, brilliant. Well, it was really great. I really enjoyed doing this. And oh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, please, uh, everyone in the group, let us know what you feel and what you'd like to hear more of. Um, and we'll hopefully do this again soon. Stay safe, everyone. It was great Take talking care. to you. Rachel. Take care. Bye, Adam. Take care. Bye-bye.